I'm Doug Silliman, the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to today's program covering the space program and advanced technology in the United Arab Emirates. Now, we are very honored to have Her Excellency Sarah Alamiri, the Minister of State uh, for the United Arab Emirates for Public Education and Advanced Technology, the Director or Chair of the Emirates Space Agency, the Emirates Science, Scientist Council, the Fourth Industrial Revolution Council, and a number of other very important positions in science and technology in the Emirates. She has got a master's and bachelor's degree from the American University of Sharjah in computer engineering. I visited there last November, a beautiful campus. Um, and uh, Madam Minister, I want to welcome you here. It is a great honor to have you with us. Um, and I will open the floor by saying, is there anything you'd like to tell us to begin this conversation? First off, a very good afternoon to everyone. It's great being here with you, and thank you for coming in for this conversation. Um, across the portfolios that we're currently working in, Emir in the Emirates towards diversifying our economy, science technology is becoming ever more important. And one of the primary objectives that we are working on is to ensure that research and development becomes a key driver of the economy. Now, it's simple to say that, but what does that really mean? in reality and how do you actually implement it on the ground. The outcomes of research and development can only be realized if they are impl uh, impacted and actually go into implementation across uh, the various sectors of the economy. We need to increase our absorptive capacity not only to adopt technology, but to be able to further enhance and develop it across key areas of the industry. And then if we look at the uh, at various sectors, what we've done is broken down what do we really require from research and development. Uh, a sense of purpose has been very important in understanding how we would like to drive that forward. And our primary sense of purpose today is to ensure that it's, it is the backbone towards the diversification of key sectors within the economy. We are focusing on key challenges and finding solutions to key challenges that we are facing within the Emirates, but again, it's being faced around the world, especially with, uh, on the topic of climate change, sustainability, and ensuring that our sources of water and food are accessed sustainably and do have the necessary relevance from an economic perspective. So rather than being burdensome on the economy, they actually generate value within it. If we go to the topic of space, and it sort of carries on from there, uh, space is one of the industrial sectors within the economy that will have a relevance in terms of driving diversification forward. What we are doing is moving from a nation that was a utilizer of space technologies up until about 20 tend to a deliver uh, to a, to a, to a deliver sorry developer of space technologies after that and today it's it's less about developing technologies for the sake of research and advancing research but more about developing those space technologies for the sake of increasing demand within the space sector and therefore focusing largely on commercial space so that's sort of a broad direction on why is this drive important for us um, there's various mechanisms that we are approaching it depending on where the sector is uh, and an understanding of where the relevance is so that you're creating the necessary levers, funding mechanisms, partnerships both globally and also within the region uh, to be able to drive that transformation forward. Well, thank you very much. And I, I want to start with a relatively specific question because there's a lot going on in the UAE space program in the coming couple of weeks. So maybe you can describe for our audience what's happening right now. Um, and I've got a couple of questions that have already come in uh, asking about the things that are gonna be happening in the next couple of weeks. So um, an Emirati astronaut uh, is uh, heading to the International Space Station for the first long-term um, long project for, uh, sorry, a long-term stay within the International Space, uh, space Station of any Arab na nation. Uh, the launch is happening in the next few days out of uh, Cape Canaveral in uh, Florida. Uh, it, uh, the astronaut is part of the Crew-6 mission. This mission is being led by uh, one of our research institutions out of the Emirates, uh, which is the Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Space uh, Center. The team has been working very hard. Uh, Sultan Niyadi, who's the astronaut who's going up, uh, is a remarkable individual uh, who has developed from the inception of the, uh, of, the, of the astronaut program within the Emirates, trained up to par with global uh, astronauts, and today provides us a new venue for science and scientific discovery for the country uh, by heading to the International Space Station. This, of course, is just one of many programs under our, our, um, under our space agents, uh, sorry, under our space sector. 
uh, be it under the remit of the federal government or be it under the remit of private companies uh, within the country and also research institution. This ecosystem has grown remarkably. The last uh, numbers that we've had in is our research spending since 2018 till today has more than doubled. Uh, large increase in terms of manpower, large increase in terms of the impact, both direct and indirect, uh, onto our economy and also onto um, harnessing further scientific discovery and scientific development. So there's quite a few programs that are leading up to, up to that. And there's something that's very important that we have underlying that. What we're doing as an agency is ensuring that we take on and provide risk offtake to um, to the the nascent space sector from the commercial perspective from from commercial space, so from individuals all the way to smaller companies and companies that are willing to diverse into that are tangential to the space sector but willing to invest in further into the space sector, through our programs we are ensuring that we are off taking a lot of the risks that you require to build the necessary heritage to enter into the global. Uh, space sector. The second is to be able to work with them on developing key technologies across different programs because delivery of, is of the utmost importance. And then the third is creation of demand. Globally, we need to, uh, globally and especially uh, regionally, um, there are so many different untapped utilizations of the space sector and either data coming from space or um, or, or technologies coming from space. So largely what we're working is to increase that demand by sectors that usually use space as a service and use space technology as a tool. Uh, and that is very important for the sustainability of the sector. Overall, we're not a nation that usually subsidizes uh, sectors. What we ensure is that there is organic growth uh, capitalized on it, there is risk offtake, there is partnership mechanisms to be able to grow these sectors sustainably. And if we don't do that, then it's, it will be reliant highly on research endeavors by the government and not be a closed uh, ecosystem that drives transformation forward. And if you'll permit me to ask you a couple of a little more personal questions. The first one, I mean, as an American who grew up in the 60s and the 70s, I remember the immense pride that I felt as a child and as a young adult in the U.S. space program. The first been on the moon, various satellites, and the installation of a whole GPS system, uh, first for military, then commercially. Um, what does it feel like to be an Emirati and have this next step um, in the development of the Emirates space program uh, coming to fruition? So what, especially someone as, who's been as involved in the program as you have. So I, I can speak to the general excitement that was there over the course of the last decade of the space sector, but something that has been, a, there was a moment that we saw a palpable transformation on what we were as a nation prior to the 9th of February 2021 and who we are as a nation post February 9th, 2021. I think 2021 was a, a monumental year for the Emirates. Um, it, it was the year of, of start of recovery for us from COVID. Uh, we arrived to Mars at the beginning of that year. Towards the end of the year, we hosted the world in, um, in Expo 2020. It was the same year as well that we put our endeavor forward for COP28 that's being hosted this year. Why is it monumental for us? It happened to be our 50th anniversary, uh, but it had a more significance in terms of its transformation nature. And it wasn't a planned, as you know, it, it was yeah, 2021 happened to be the year after the world stood still. And the palpable difference that, that we felt as a nation, as people that live within the United Arab Emirates, is an understanding of what it means to realize the, the impactful potential of, uh, potential of taking a large risk of tolerating in front of the world on a global stage that, that doing this for the first time doesn't really work that 50% of these nations, uh, of these missions fail, but being okay with these consequences because it was about the journey, it was about the development of talent, it was about catalyzing change, and it was about changing mindsets on the benefits of taking monumental risks that then turn into wider impact. So uh, personally for me, that was a the, the start of that sort of monumental shift within uh, within our uh, within our society, but most interestingly as well, across the portfolios on science and technology, uh, for me, I noticed a difference from the day off till the, the day before and the day after. 
the day after and the months after, there, were, there was an even greater interest on, on investing further in science technology, an even greater in, interest in diversifying our portfolio of investments, and an even greater interest on the value of developing talent in a different way to be able to create that long-term impact uh, uh, within, within um, any nation. So it's, it's, it's that sort of dynamic that is, I think, very hard to explain unless you're, you've lived in the Emirates and gone through it. Uh, but that, that, I think, was the first milestone of 2021. There was a few that happened to come after. Some of them were unplanned, uh, but happened to happen on the, uh, on the same year. And it's created an interesting dynamical shift in, in the way we approach things and the growth path that the nation has taken and the significance that we, we put a, a, on global relations and the importance of continuing to diverse, diversify even global relations forward. And let me ask the, the second personal question, and I think this really is more personal. Um, for you personally, why space? Coming out of university as a computer engineer, what drew you to this area? What inspired you? Um, and how did you get there? It was completely by accident. <laughs> Um, it, it wasn't something that I put in my mind ever to work in the space sector. Um, the entity that I joined was established in 2006. I joined it in 2009. Uh, not a lot of publicity around it, not a lot of development. So I don't think space was something that I had in mind. Um, I just happened to walk into an interview there. But what intrigued me was uh, the approach to design and development. I loved designing software uh, and developing it and being able to take something from a set of requirements on a document in black and white to an actual, um, an actual platform that did something that didn't exist before. You went into coding it. Uh, and that's where, that's where I wanted to go to. I found that the space program provided that because the way that it was initiated was on the principles of know-how transfer. So it's not about bu buying spacecraft. It was about jointly developing spacecrafts with those that have been doing it for decades upon decade to be able to expedite learning, uh, move towards implementation, be able to build more and more complex spacecrafts and missions. And that's, that's what drew me to that sort of methodology of working. One of the earlier things that you did in your career in the space sector was uh, you were the science director for the Emirates Mars mission. And you wrote in 2021 that you wanted the Emirates Mars mission to be a disruptor. My question is, what did you want to disrupt, and was it, has it been successful as a disruptor? And if so, how has it been successful? So I'll correct that. It wasn't me who wanted it to be a disruptor. Ah, okay. uh, it was our prime minister uh, upon bringing this program uh, in late 2014, I think, is when we started working on the concept um, that wanted this to be a disruptor. Now, why? Uh, because the path that we took to developing this was unlike any path any other mission in any other country ever took. And what that meant is you're rethinking the mechanism and methodology of developing and designing such, such missions. The factor that was a disruptor was not getting to Mars. It was actually the timeline and the ridiculously low budget that we got. Um, and it was those two aspects that were completely out of the norm of building similar spacecrafts that usually cost double uh, and sometimes had about double the time uh, to build with an ability to go and ask for, for more budget and go over budget, where we were strictly told at the very beginning, this is all you're getting in terms of time and this is all you're getting in terms of, of, uh, uh, of funding. And that just, I think, disrupted uh, the approach. And I think what I said in the article is I was, it was very painful but I was very grateful that that was the situation that we were placed in because today there's another approach to building spacecrafts to go to other planets. And we're actually capitalizing on that and building. So that mission for us was five times more difficult. Without getting to Mars, we wouldn't have been able to venture into uh, our mission to the asteroid belt, which is again, five times more uh, complex. But because we were able to demonstrate a mechanism to lower complexity, to create the necessary impact and outcomes, it made that mission possible, but it also made that mission possible because like I, I, I spoke about earlier, the underlying factor that we're currently working on today is getting on more commercial space from the Emirates and using these different platforms to build their capabilities. It's allowed us to raise the bar and allow other uh, entities or individuals who are interested in setting up their businesses to start working with us on it. So even change, 
change the model and approach to building um, a spacecraft from having it to be a one entity focus to a multi-entity, multidisciplinary at various levels of, of, of maturity mechanism of building a mission. And I've read a lot of the literature on the founding of uh, the UAE Space Agency, the Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Space Center, um, and I constantly see two broad roles, one of which you've talked about. It's development of commercial technology and involving the private sector in an otherwise government-heavy endeavor. But the other one is the pursuit of pure scientific knowledge, the advancement of, you know, uh, for all of humankind. Can you talk a little bit about maybe your personal goals in this area and what you think uh, the Emirates Mars mission or the upcoming mission uh, uh, might contribute to human knowledge and how that advances the Emirates as well. Sure. Um, in terms of just the nation's broad research and development uh, priorities, you would always have directed research and you would always have undirected research for the pure benefit of generating completely new knowledge that unbeknownst to all of us today that we will not realize the benefit of it, but it will, but the benefit of it will be realized for in generations to come. And for us, this is very important because when you create a value, you don't just create a value that you need to extract out of it its outcomes in the next year, in the next five years, in the next decade or two decades uh, that you need to realize that. Science allows you to even ensure sort of an insurance policy down the line uh, to be able to uh, grow that body of knowledge and be able to um, contribute to it globally. So knowledge sharing becomes very important. Now, when it came to our scientific missions, uh, what we wanted to ensure is that you were already putting an investment. And I said it was our, our budget was very low, but I mean, in space terms, you're talking about $400 million. It's not a small investment. Uh, space is very expensive. It makes absolutely no sense for you to put that amount of money, send a spacecraft anywhere, uh, collect data that scientists don't need and won't further uh, scientific knowledge. Just makes, it, it's just bad investment and it's bad bad prioritization. And what we ensured across our mission, starting from the Emirates Mars mission, is that the type of science done hasn't been done before. Therefore, scientists require the data to be able to further enhance our knowledge of our solar system around us. And there, I mean, there's a lot of missions going to Mars, but in the larger scale of things of what we need to understand about that planet and the changes that has happened to it, that eerily, if we don't take care of our own planet, might be our future. Um, there, is, there is a lot of science to get done. And when we talk about our asteroid belt mission where there is, it's just such a vast portion of our solar system that there's really not a lot, not enough missions going there to be able to tap into that. And that's a value that intrinsically maybe a lot of people don't know, but the Emirates has. Mm. Uh, we have a founding father that, I mean, sending the astronaut tomorrow uh, sorry, the next two days uh, to the International Space Station. Uh, we call it in Arabic, Zayed, or the aspirations of Zayed, who's our founding father. And the reason for that, he looked at the US space program at the beginning of the nation in the 70s. And it's, it's, it's that understanding that long-term, we all, uh, as citizens of this nation, not only need to realize potential today and value today, but we need to also realize potential for down the line because it's a generation on generation development process rather than a singular um, closed time outcomes that you need to hit. That's an interesting point that you make because I was going to ask you about the importance of international partnerships in your program. Um, even through all the political problems of the past couple of decades, there has continued to be cooperation between political or military adversaries in the United States, but still with cooperation in space. So for the UAE's program, what has been your path to international cooperation? How important uh, has that been to your success? Um, and where do you see that going in the future? So international cooperation is a major element of our space program, and it needs to continue being a major element of the global space sector. The global space sector with the aspirations that we have, with the kinds of discoveries that need to move forward, with the growth of commercial space that knows no boundary, you, you can't get away with not, uh, with not cooperating. You can't get away with not 
uh, continuing this sort of long-term uh, view of things. Yes, cooperation started, but there are inst inst instances, Ambassador, especially in last year, uh, where for the first time in the history of space, space has been politicized. And for us, that was a, a point of reflection uh, by which we established a platform called the Abu Dhabi Space Debate that was held for the first time last uh, December with the primary purpose of a general sense of understanding as humanity. We cannot um, politicize space. Space will remain a shared resource. Uh, access to space and being able to send spacecrafts, especially to low Earth orbit, isn't a choice or a glory project. We all use space data on a daily basis, whether we know it or not, which makes the overarching relevance of ensuring the growth of the sector, ensuring that the politics of Earth do not go into space. We will run into an access to space issue and sustainability of low Earth orbit of space that we need to cooperate in, uh, especially with more and more spacecrafts uh, going into low Earth orbit, which is where most of our assets need to be in. Um, and then at the same time, cooperation creates a large drive for emerging space nations and also creates a large drive for uh, private space, be it in creating demand for, for offtake from private space, as we see, for example, in the astronauts that are going into space now from different countries, um, all the way to ensuring that we have the data that we require today to be able to make decisions in, in, in important areas of our daily lives. And it continues to be something that's foundational for us, but we continue to work together with the global community to ensure that space is not politicized, dialogue continues, mutual respect uh, is there, transparency is also there within the space sector uh, across uh, countries and nations. As you mentioned, more and more countries are beginning to think about how they want to engage with space, whether they want to have their own programs, universities, even individual students are coming up with their own ideas. Mm -hmm. What is your advice, at least for nations that want to begin a program the way that the Emirates did 15 years ago? Um, what are the pitfalls they should look out for? What advice do you have for another country that wants to follow a path that looks something like the UAE, but follows the priorities of a different nation? So the first is understanding what you want from the space sector. So I spoke earlier about research and development. Our first step is understanding what did we want from the research and development. It was the same thing from the space sector. Initially, what we wanted from the space sector is development of capability for engineers to design and develop complex systems. It then evolved to um, adding on science and scientists to be able to, to bring forward that evolution. Today, it's towards commercial space, uh, and we're focusing a lot on Earth observation. We're also have had a focus for a very long time in, in communication and we're taking that forward. So the purpose by which the space sector, sorry, the, the purpose by which the space sector um, is designed to is the mechanism by which it ensures actual success because you're designing it towards how it fits in into the wider uh, development of a nation's agenda or a nation's program or their priorities. Um, and that can manifest into different ways. I mean, if your priority is direct commercialization, then you don't need to own a space asset today. You can focus on data analytics. You can um, develop and enhance through different commercial endeavors with different countries and move on from there. Um, the second thing is to be aware that the space sector is a highly risky business. Um, you're designing uh, spacecrafts uh, from the inception all the way till delivery a lot of risk associated, a lot of iterations on development. Uh, so partnerships then become important. And the mechanism by which you weave partners, partnerships becomes important because that's how you're able to um, mitigate risks in some situations and be able to deliver on the overall outcomes in other situations. So that's the second um, aspect. And then what we love to always re repeat, space is hard, space is expensive. <laughs> You need to know that going into this, um, there will be failures. It's just the nature of the, um, of, of the sector. And uh, you need to have the appetite for that. You need to even have the appetite to recover from it quickly and be able to create the next success. Um, maybe the last question as I go through a, a list of space questions is, is really what looks to me in um, the program and the uh, 
Advanced Technology Ministry, Ministry's websites is the ways that you adopt and adapt new ideas, which sounds in many ways sort of entrepreneurial. You have competitions with students and experts to come up with new ideas, new experiments that might be included in future missions. So um, how do you use these outside ideas, things that don't come from inside the space program, and how do you manage these ideas and uh, essentially run your competitions and decide which ideas are most valuable for the program? So that's where the tools come in. I call these different tools by which you're, you're able to move a sector forward and, and be able to meet your objectives. So we have very directed objectives in terms of where we want to head to, and those manifest into specific programs that need to be doing specific forms of observation, developed in a particular manner because it has capability development, aligns with our overarching roadmap. So examples of that is the CERB constellation of uh, SAR satellites, and another actual example for that uh, is also the continuation post our Emirates Mars mission, which is the, uh, the mission to the asteroid belt. So those are very specific, well-defined sort of programs and endeavors moving forward. Uh, then comes the areas that are gray, I would call them, that you can meet the objective in so many different ways. Uh, that you're able to then capitalize on the best ideas. And that's when uh, it is opened. Um, and then there are other areas for us as a space sector, and, and that's, I think, the competitions that you were referring to, uh, where one mechanism to lower the cost of doing business in the space sector is to bring about forms of both soft and hard infrastructure or shared infrastructure. Uh, and we are creating a lot of platforms to be able to create that infrastructure, and that then reduces uh, cost and overhead on, on companies being established so that they're able to use that shared resource and grow and grow from there. And we enable the utilization of those shared resources through different competitions. And another mechanism is also to continue fostering and finding new international partnerships. So these sort of smaller um, platforms that are created enable that to happen, where you're able to create the necessary participation um, from different nations, but have it become more of a grassroots because we can sign so many MOUs as countries between each other. If the, if individuals within the sector don't find a value of working together, uh, it's not really going to move forward. Uh, and that's why we also create these different programs. We do the same on the technology front and technology and industry as well. And it's just uh, making sure that you're covering, we all have finite resources, but you're covering as much as you can uh, in terms of the breadth that needs to be covered uh, to ensure that, that that sector continues to be something that's sustainably grown and doesn't continue to require uh, government interjection and government injection of funds as well. Uh, I want to change a little bit the conversation to the broader question of advanced technology because obviously the space program itself comes out of the idea that the Emirates can be a center for developing um, uh, deploying and adapting and exploiting uh, technology. So it seems to me that the Emirates has got a couple of different priorities in uh, the Ministry of Advanced Technology, one of which you've talked about, which is um, developing technologies, adopting technologies. One that I'd like you to talk a little bit more about is really the policies that are needed from the part on the part of governments, either at the federal level or at the Emirate level, uh, to pursue a true policy of advanced technology. So maybe the first question is, um, what kinds of policy changes do you, as the Minister for Advanced Technology, seek to develop going forward that will make this job easier for future generations? Okay. I'll speak to, so that's a newly formed industry. The advanced technology portfolio uh, was brought together by different portfolios within the government to form a ministry in 2020, I think July 2020. Um, it was actually one of the lessons learned um, from the pandemic to ensure that our industrial sector has robustness built into it. So we, first, we looked at industrial sector. So if we need robustness to be built into our industrial sector, it needs to be th those, the, our priority industrial sectors need to be globally competitive. And globally competitive, you can do it in so many different ways. So we have several programs to do it. I'll just zoom in on the technology part. On the technology part, there is quite a lot of industry that can increase their efficiency and effectiveness by just adopting technologies, changing the mechanisms by which they, they develop and produce. Uh, we've also added sustainability as a main vertical, because as a ministry, we're committed to our uh, carbon neutral by 2050. 
uh, net zero, sorry, by, by 2050, and that also factors into our program. And the way we worked with it was at a level that that's the first policy shift. Uh, we initially had a fourth industrial revolution wide macro policy, but when we went and deep dove with industrial developers across different sectors, and we used a simple tool just to measure where they are in the spectrum of industry. Are you at two, three, four? So do you use just energy and electricity? Do you use machines and some forms of electronics? Or is your entire business running on technology and data analytics? And what we've noticed across each of the priority sector, the level of maturity was starkly different. So that was the first policy shift where we said industry 4.0 cannot be a macro uh, policy. It has to be a directed micro level at the company level po policy. And hence we developed a tool that was just launched uh, called the Trans Technology Transformation Index. It goes into companies for days and measures everything from manpower, from the entrance and exit, all the way down to the shop floor to ensure that technology is being utilized to the maximum of its ability. And then we, and then companies get basically a roadmap towards their technology development. And then the next tools we partner up with the Emirates Development Bank to ensure that they have access then to funds to be able to carry it forward. And then on the back of that, we have our in-country value program that then provides them with either offtake agreements or uh, mechanisms to boost and bolster uh, their, their, uh, their impact both within the country and also uh, outside the country. The second is, I just said, industrial sectors need to be at par globally because you need to widen the, 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 the market access. So the second has been a shift towards all these trade agreements that you see the Emirates uh, signing with different countries and that's opening up markets uh, to the country and being able to mutually grow industrial sectors and also different economic sectors across the two nations that we usually sign uh, a trade agreement with. Um, so that's on the policy front of one, technology, and then two, how to use the different levers. Then uh, about a year ago, we've established the Emirates Research and Development Council, but it covers an entire value chain. So it goes everything from basic research all the way down to commercialization, where you realize the potential and outcome um, of research. Um, and the policies that are going there are things like what are our priorities? How do we create macro priorities? How do you divide your, your, your current funding? How do you continue to attract uh, talents into the country, bridge the gap in terms of different research institutions that need to be part of that entire value chain and then different types of individuals that also need to be part of it? That approach will be a macro, again, policy approach. And then we'll start segmenting it sector by sector as a different mechanism goes into play. On the play of research development to commercialization, the government plays a role of bridging gaps. We all know that there's typical gaps that the research outcomes fall through, and you don't realize the full potential of the investment. And what we do is we bridge those gaps through different programs, policies, and, and legislations. Then comes the legislations part. The country over the course of the last two years has undergone a massive legislation change. Um, can't remember the number, but it's, I think, maybe well over 80 plus legislations that have been changed in, in the last two years. Um, our thought process towards legislations and policies has changed, especially in the nature of a lot of technologies that you would need to regulate, but you need to find the sweet spot of not over-regulating it and inhibiting development. And at the same time, mentally, we legislators need to be okay with, you're no longer going to have legislations that are going to be around for the next three decades. It's just not going to be relevant. It, it needs to be enhanced. It needs to be um, reviewed continuously. It needs to evolve as we understand more and more the nature of, uh, of the sectors. And this has becomes very relevant in areas of technology, in areas of data protection uh, that, that, that that has to undergo. So these are some of the levers that we've been working with on advanced technology to be able to start moving forward with uh, our overall uh, programming and agenda. So have you had to approach public sector adoption of technology differently? I, and even among the different emirates, I, I don't doubt that in Dubai, with Mohammed bin Rashid's leadership focusing on the future, there's probably a lot of encouragement for the government to adopt or government agencies to adopt technology. Um, have you run into a different set of problems? Do you have different emphasis 
when working with government organizations as opposed to the private sector? So I don't work directly with government. There's other entities that work on government services. But you mentioned Sinus uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. He's very adamant with encouraging us first and in terms of adopting, especially with regards to digitization. Uh, and then we just get a hard deadline. You have two years to adopt technologies across uh, the following services. So we've had these sort of milestones of transformation from e-government services in the early 2000s till today, ensuring that with a few applications on your phone, you can do most of your government services. You no longer need to go to service centers. Most of the government entities have been asked to shut down uh, their service centers, uh, to have them all online. Our ministry doesn't have physical um, service centers for someone to go into. So th that drive in terms of digitization has just been a mechanism by which the government wants to operate to ensure that access to um, services is done seamlessly and without disruptions and we continue to review them as we move forward. And like you said, there's the tool sets that you would use in those types of services that, you would, uh, that, that are provided within the government are completely different than ones you would use in industry. Um, and that's also being handled by a few other entities within the country to ensure that. And in, the same programs are relatively replicated at the local level. What's interesting, whenever you see a success story, if it's at the local level, it will be elevated federally. Uh, if there's a federal practice that is usually effective, it will be uh, cascaded down locally. So um, as we get sort of past the midpoint of our discussion, I encourage those of you in our Zoom audience, if you have questions or comments, please use the Q&A function on Zoom so we can get those into the conversation. Uh, for those of you in the room, if you're interested, again, just turn your nameplate sideways and we'll, we'll call on you. Um, you didn't mention as part of the strategy education. And it strikes me that in a country that is aiming for a very quick development and deployment of advanced technology, you've got to start early and use your own educational institution. So how do you see education at any or all levels playing a part in what you do at the Ministry of Advanced Technology and even the, uh, the space program? Um, we, no one's going to disagree that education is foundational yeah. uh, to any loops of transformation across either an economy or any sector or any country. Um, so our president has called the education sector his number one priority. Um, at, at the moment, he announced that during our government, uh, our, our whole of government meeting, I think in November or October last year. <clears throat> and what that really translates into is to ensure that your, your education system um, allows people to, to or provides people with the necessary skills and values that are required and transforms the development of skills and values uh, as one of the priorities uh, that are important drivers for change. And why? Because knowledge is attainable. But how you use knowledge, how you think, uh, how you think through it, uh, how you solve problems, how you are a, a, an individual who is respectful of differences around the world rather than contentious of, 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 uh, of differences in the world. That is very important if you're talking about uplifting um, economies of the future. Then if you take those sets of skills and those sets of values, uh, knowledge is then uh, used as an enhancer to develop them and be able to evolve them forward. Um, and you create then a mechanism for various path lines of uh, development for individuals, and there's a lot of opportunities that then become um, available to go into in terms of specializations. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting journey. I, I do, um, uh, I'm on a separate portfolio to, to the ones that we just spoke about, uh, oversee our public school systems. We're working together with teachers and, and educators to um, to enhance our current public education system and ensure that those me new mechanisms of teaching, those new mechanisms of assessment, those new mechanisms of growth uh, are embedded within our education system and that children are then allowed uh, to have all the opportunities that they would like to seek and then schools start becoming an enabler for that. So that's about the formal pathways, the educational programs, where, you know, what schools are able to do. 
Let me take that again to the very personal or even attitudinal. Um, it seems to me that the SpaceX Crew-6 launch is a real opportunity to take into classrooms. Um, are you doing things like this? Are you having public events in the Emirates that, will, that you will encourage people to come and watch so that uh, they can get into the spirit of you know, this idea of progress and use of advanced technology? I mean, how are you using this in, in a more moral sense and a less you know, policy sense to encourage future generations of Emiratis to, uh, uh, to come along for the yeah. ride to space? So in the in wider, uh, I won't only talk about the space because we also have we have space this year and we have the sustainability agenda as well. What happens is that we leverage extracurricular activities and thematic sort of um, either school visits or thematic um, um, years to be able to enhance that understanding. Um, something that's important to realize: it's not always about the curriculum. Uh, you need to enhance a student's journey through experiencing. Um, What's, what happens in the world around them through different mechanisms and through different venues. We've had very interesting mechanisms that we've done, it with, the, we've done with the Emirates Mars mission in terms of just humanizing a scientist um, so that it doesn't become something that they're apprehensive of. In terms of sustainability, what, we, what we're currently working on in terms of programming is just to make sure that they understand. They understand what is a COP. Um, why do people around the world need to get together uh, to discuss climate change? Why is the target of 1.5 degrees important? What does it mean to them and their environment? And what they, can they do as individuals within their schools to be able to move that forward? And all of that is not sort of curriculum or related uh, changes. They're co-curricular. And at the same time, they're also extracurricular activities. And a mechanism that we want to further enhance that is to make our schools closer and closer to the community. And as, you, and as you do that, you remove sort of the barriers um, of classical education within the confines of a school to become, at least in thought, uh, a lifelong education process uh, that where education is not only about what you read uh, and what you learn in the classroom, but it's the entire experience. And, it's in t and it includes exposure to different people, different uh, ways of thinking. Uh, different areas that are of interest. So space does feature there. Uh, same thing with um, um, sustainability for this year. Uh, robotics also has a large part, but also arts and, and uh, music also plays a, right, uh, a, la a large part. Heritage is also something that we're starting to put in, in terms of programming, just to understand the various sports that were played here locally and um, ar arts and music uh, that, that are part of our heritage as well. And what's interesting for me in taking that approach is that it becomes broad. You don't, you don't need to be interested in, in advanced physics to be able to understand how a spacecraft is built. If you put it into the curriculum, it's just open to a certain segment. But if it's an extracurricular activity, it just broadens the ability for people to understand it and then be able to create their own pathways if that's a sector of relevance. And it doesn't always need to be that core uh, pathway of, of, those, uh, of those areas. Uh, let's take a question from the audience. First, go to uh, Steve Clements. Please, Steve. Thank you very much, and good to see you, Minister. You. Um, I'm really, you know, we, truth in advertising, we've talked before about uh, the space program and the different components that had to come together inside the uh, Emirates, um, particularly educationally and others. But I'm really interested in the resistors. You know, those, those people who look at you, your success, this extraordinary story, how fast it's gone is something they don't want, not only inside the Emirates, but regionally, because you're, you sort of have this iconic role, woman minister into space, et cetera. How do you seduce the people who don't see this as a good bet for their society, their daughters, their families? How do you bring them over? Um, is, it, is it personally or system-wise? Well, you, you and I have talked before about that even in the schools and education system, that, that what you represent is a cultural shift and change. And part of what the leader is trying to do is, is basically say modernity is the UAE's path not only to leadership but transformative uh, in the region. And a lot of people don't buy that message. And I'm just interested in how you move the equilibrium of those people resisting that message forward. By delivering. Yeah. Simply by delivering. Because if, you, if you're going to address every single 
uh, point of contention. We, I'll speak to the Emirates Mars mission. I think until the day we arrived, we had a lot of people that didn't believe that it was going to happen, that our approach was wrong, um, the mechanisms that we were deploying was something that is completely out of the norm for the entire sector, that we're jeopardizing the country and putting them at risk and so on. Those are things that we were hearing all the way till the day off. Uh, but the fact that you have um, key individuals within the country believing in the power of transformation, and by the way, transformation and modernity shouldn't always be associated with changing in terms of who you are as individuals and who you are as a culture. It's about enhancing portions of your culture and who we are as con collective individuals to be able to create more growth. So you're not deriving it out of nothing. Um, risk taking, for example, has been the way that our parents grew up in, our grandparents. There wasn't a lot of resources. They had to go and find the right pathways the right trade mechanisms to be able to simply survive. So it's not something that is completely new to our culture, but it's something that we need to enhance given the day and age that we live in. That's just one example. Uh, and the only way that you can um, respond to any doubter is actually not address it, but be able to deliver and continue to move forward. Otherwise, we will just stagnate and be busy with arguing, which is useless waste of time, doesn't progress forward, um, and is not aligned with, with, with the delivery mindset. Let's go to Jeff, uh, Jeff Faust. Please, Jeff, go ahead. <clears> Hi, <throat> right, Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, given Crew 6 launch coming up uh, this weekend, uh, what do you see as the future for human spaceflight for the UAE? I know you have a four-person astronaut core. Um, this flight will feature the second Emirati to go to space. Um, do you foresee future astronaut missions to the space station, cooperation with China's human spaceflight program, um, or even potentially working as part of the uh, Artemis uh, lunar exploration program and sending Emiratis to the moon? If it's okay with you, Jeff, I'll address that from the perspective of the global future of, uh, of human space exploration. Um, as you know, uh, human space exploration will continue to expand in low Earth orbit with more and more commercial space. And the question here for us is how do you as a young nation d d uh, invest in the growth of the um, private space and be able to capitalize on it to be able to push research forward and your research agenda forward uh, in microgravity research. Uh, now it can feature our astronaut core, but the current mechanism that, that low Earth orbit is going towards will also enable you to expand your, your uh, research cap capabilities above and beyond uh, your own astronauts performing research. So that's the, the first uh, endeavor in terms of uh, outside Earth's orbit, uh, be it the Artemis or, or the moon, uh, that becomes something that's currently uh, being looked at and aligned with regards to prioritization. But again, um, where governments are today at the International Space Station, that's where governments are going to be beyond Earth orbit. And commercial space is uh, right now really interesting for us to see where the value proposition is to be able to enhance those capabilities there. Right, uh, let's go to Robert Mogilnecki. Robert? Thank you. Rob Mogulnicki, one of the senior resident scholars here at the Institute. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you for, for joining us today. You did a great job going over what you're working on within the UAE, but as uh, no doubt you're aware, a number of other regional states are investing quite heavily in localizing R&D and also promoting advanced and emerging technologies. This is absolutely going on in Saudi Arabia, but even the smaller Gulf states, um, Qatar Science and Technology Park, Bahrain, FinTech in Bahrain come to mind, just to name a few. Uh, could you speak toward these regional activities that fall under your remit and whether they have or will create opportunities for collaboration, but also whether and how they'll also raise the competitive stakes in the region? Thank you. Uh, in terms of cooperation, yes, I can speak to the space sector. We've had very good cooperation, for example, with Bahrain uh, on that. There is continued regional uh, cooperation across different fronts. Uh, 
that are off priority and that usually percolates over to the technology front as well. Uh, in terms of competition, competition is always an amazing way to spur its growth forward even faster. So it, it's good that, that the region is investing quite widely on diversifying their, their technology portfolio, diversifying their research portfolio, localizing talent, uh, and also building, uh, building new segments of their economies. Uh, for us, it is creating opportunities and new opportunities for growth, be it by cooperation or by the healthy competition that usually exists but spurts uh, development forward. And at the end, I'll go back to something that I initially mentioned each nation usually develops these capabilities for their particular purpose, uh, and, and therefore that there is a room for everyone to be investing in, in a diverse uh, uh, set of purposes and, uh, and visions moving forward. And then straight across from, so I can't read your name now. First of all, so congrats on the launch of the satellite this Saturday. I think it's uh, very exciting, and thank you. Uh, but one question I had for you, and you talked about it briefly earlier, about international collaboration and need to have some kind of framework that countries or companies commit to or follow. But space is becoming increasingly congested, right, and contested too. And it's not just countries, it's private sector understanding more and more the value of space services or technology to support the di digital infrastructure on Earth. I guess my question is, if you don't get countries to collaborate, what are some of the security and governance risks that you see coming down the line? Because we're talking about you know, party stakeholders who can't solve their problems on Earth, right? What happens? How do you get them to work? And if they can't, what are some of those risks? So one of them, I think the eminent, and by eminence, by the way, I don't mean the next year or two years, <laughs> I'm talking here in, in decades, one of the most eminent uh, challenges that we will all face is the increase of space debris in this small area around Earth. Uh, what that means is that we really need to cooperate, especially space situational awareness becomes very important. Nobody wants to build a spacecraft. I just told you spacecrafts are expensive. I know the smaller ones are relatively cheaper, but again, relatively. Uh, no one wants disruption of their space systems wh while they're in space. So there is a common need uh, of knowing any imminent danger that will be on a spacecraft. Uh, the third, if we do not cooperate and find the right mechanism to be able to at least maintain the current congestion in space and not increase it, um, it will eventually become a resource that not a lot of countries can access. Uh, and that becomes, uh, becomes dangerous because one, it will form technology disparity, which I think nobody wants. And at the same time, uh, it will inhibit our ability to get access. So it will go from the state that the space sector is amazingly in now in terms of cost and access to space and availability of data to how it was at the very beginning with few a countries having access to space, limited number of data and so on. So if we don't want to have another climate crisis like we're having right now and we're just having discussions that are leading us nowhere, we need to figure out how we're going to cooperate in space. Hence the platform that I spoke about earlier that we formed, but again, we have that as part of our agenda as a nation. And countries, at least the space sector itself, is very much aware that its livelihood lies um, in ensuring that we do cooperate well. So I'm optimistic uh, at this point uh, with regards to, be a to being able to crack this, but we really need to come together, have open discussions, tell our politicians to leave space out of their political repertoire um, and then be able to move forward from there. Uh, Raha. Thank you so much. Uh, Raha Akim Navar, I'm the founder and CEO of Zion Space, um, new, new startup uh, working on the Earth observations field. Uh, so I. It's wonderful to see that you have so much foresight from the kind of more established space uh, organizations, agencies, and how that space economy has, has rolled out. And as you said, um, space is hard, it's expensive, and there, the likelihood of, you know, the risk of failure is quite high compared to other endeavors. 
So can you talk a little bit more about the public-private kind of collaboration that, you know, with the foresight that you have, um, what is the strategy there and how are you enabling, I mean, especially for the commercial companies, that upfront cost of hardware in particular is quite high and coupled with high risk can be quite challenging for, for startups. Can you talk a little bit about that ecosystem and how the, uh, from a public sector perspective, you're um, able to, you know, enable that innovation and maybe alleviate some of that risk? So we're doing it in several mechanisms. I'll speak to the hardest, which is development of hardware or, or subsystems that you would eventually be part of a global value chain. Uh, and those are usually individuals that are just thinking about starting their businesses. They haven't really established it. Or companies that are just starting to, to set up. And the mechanism that we're working with them on is to actually uh, give them parts of some of our spacecrafts to either design and develop to be part of in terms of services part of our development process and we use uh, two missions as that and they are onboarded on um, as team members to be able to gain that necessary knowledge and at the same time be able to build their companies. On the wider sense we've created space economic zones across a few areas of uh, the country and I think the best way to explain it is is a direct concierge service by the space agency, uh, where you have direct contact with the space uh, agency employees. Uh, we try to link them up in terms of opportunities. They are with us on various partnerships, be it locally or internationally, to be able to create the necessary businesses for them. Another mechanism that we've done for Earth observation is created a platform for data analytics and also access to data uh, without upfront cost. Um, and also provided them with um, very small projects, but sort of running cost s uh, situation where they're able to deliver on uh, particular studies or particular programs and so on. Um, what other way do we do that? Uh, we're also developing, again, capabilities of those that are interested in space but not necessarily sure if they want to enter into it. And it's catered a lot towards fresh graduates to see if they want to enter into the sector and eventually spin out. Uh, and we do have a uh, uh, program internally of employee to business owner, uh, where you have at least for a period of time the safety of having a salary as you're developing your program, uh, sorry, your, your business. And then that also is a mechanism to do that. Uh, we're doing it at the micro level. So we've started this less than a year ago. Uh, we're evolving it into what we're calling the Emirates Capability Development Program. Uh, the Space Fund also plays a large uh, uh, role in that. Uh, and as we start sort of tweaking the mechanism, so especially that we're starting now with a few uh, entities, it becomes very easy to iteratively build towards the right program as we learn and as we also uh, ensure that they're developing at the same time. So again, different tools, do we have them all um, packaged, I think, at the, at the final stage, no, but we're growing it as we're moving forward with the different companies. David? Your Excellency, David from the US UAE Business Council. I'd like to ask about AI. Um, I know the UAE has been a leader in this with the Minister of State for AI and MBZUA for AI University, um, and, uh, but I imagine it infuses a lot of your work, whether space, industrialization, education. Um, so from your perspective, and particularly with all the news about you know, chat GPT, um, what are some of the um, potentials of AI? Uh, and what are some of the um, things you worry about? Uh, what are some of the guardrails uh, you put in place? What are your views on how to best leverage this and, and perhaps work in the private sector partner as well? Um, AI, technology in general, is a tool. So you don't develop AI for the sake of AI, especially if you want to infuse it across your, your current sectors. You find mechanisms by which you leverage it as a tool for the benefit of uh, either solving a problem, creating a new opportunity, overcoming a challenge, and so on. In terms of potential, I, potential is limitless for what AI can do. But like any tool, if it's used in the right place, you realize the right potential of it. If it's used in the wrong place at the wrong time, then you don't, re you don't necessarily realize the potential of it. In terms of governing a AI personally, um, my biggest 
concern, personal concern, is is building bias into AI uh, that will make it not not inclusive, um, skewed in some areas, and then creates a massive ripple effect. Uh, and one area that is not governed but needs to be governed is sort of a framework on how you develop those AI systems rather than how you govern AI. I know we're talking a lot about how do you govern the different um, AI systems that are in place, and it's not about that. It's it's about it's the start, because uh, and the foundational elements that goes into building an AI system that are very important. In terms of robotics, uh, and how it mixes with AI across industry, it has a vast potential. But I, I spoke about our index earlier. It's very we've seen companies and industrial players that have adopted AI at times that are not relevant. They've basically spent an amount of money into a system that doesn't is not the solution they're looking for. So maybe a word of caution here is to find the right tool for the problem you're solving or for the direction you're going to rather than purchasing or investing in the shiniest object that is part of the hype of today. So last question from the audience to Chris Cobell. Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank you so much for being here, Your Excellency. Uh, I just have a quick question. How do you see you know, the international business community fitting into the development of the Emirates advanced tech sector? Um, how do you balance the benefits that international cooperation in the business community can bring with some, you know, more recent policies around localization? Our policies actually have both. So if you look at the wider set of policies, there will be those that are enhancing local content and those that are meant to attract um, foreign direct investment and attract also international cooperation. So it, it spans the entire sector. The whole important part of it is having a balanced approach uh, towards development and having different approaches based on, on the different needs that are required in terms of growth. So we're not shying away from international cooperation at all uh, and all the different agreements of trade that have been signed just over the course of the last 12 months are evident to that. And let me take a question from the audience, one we have from Alyssa Christeller, who used to work here with us and also worked at uh, Expo uh, when that was on at the U.S. Pavilion. Uh, she asks, uh, do you find it difficult, is there competition in the space sector with other sort of intellectual areas uh, uh, in developing R&D? Does, how does the ecosystem work? How do you fit into um, life sciences, manufacturing, other advanced technology and research, maybe even throwing in AI, since there's a focus on that. And how do you compete for resources, and how do you do that successfully? Well, competing for science resources, high-tech resources, is just a global issue. Uh, competing for talent, again, is a global issue. Um, how do you address that? Uh, by creating the most interesting opportunities. People are attracted to opportunities that are challenging and interesting, especially talent. Um, that's coupled with, you spoke about education, so a wider sort of long-term vision to ensure that you're providing opportunities to people to grow in areas that are of uh, importance. Um, how does f competition fit into the wider ecosystem? I don't see competition in, in space, to be honest, personally. Um, it, it's the healthy competition in space has actually what allowed us to grow as a nation in the space sector at the speed that we grew in. So it's actually a huge opportunity of development. And just look, have a personal belief that competition is great in, in just expediting uh, development down the line. Uh, and you need to just create the right uh, mechanisms to be able to leverage on those, um, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, I, I have two final questions for you before we close out. They're both focused on the future of space and the future of technology, both in the Emirates and globally. Um, the first one, uh, you have said that you see in the future many countries will be developing at least low, low uh, Earth orbit programs. Um, how do you see the future of, and you don't see space competition per se, so does this mean you see an ecosystem in which countries can cooperate and specialize in certain pieces? And if so, what does the Emirates Space Program look like in your view in 20 years time or in 30 years time? Will you be building space launch vehicles? Will you be developing 
experiments? Will we be training astronauts uh, or any other part of space? So what, how do you see your program developing in the future given this predicted expanse of international uh, space involvement? So there is competition in space, just to, to elaborate on that. But again, it's not a, it's not your traditional thought of what competition usually is in terms of driving people out of business. It's actually, I'll call it iterative growth, cooperation-focused competition that grows the entire sector and pushes it forward. And that's sort of the phase that the space sector is in. Uh, so it is a competition is actually a growth opportunity more than anything else. But there is competition between different players uh, at uh, the sector. In terms of how do we see, I'll speak to, I'm, I'm very pragmatic, so I'll speak to the next five years in terms of delivery and our overarching 10 years, and that's usually the direction by we're going, that we're going uh, down the path just to be able to deliver uh, on outcomes. In the next five years, demand of space uh, uh, products and services becomes very important from other sectors to realize the sustainability of the growth of the sector. Um, enhancing our ability to design and develop and, and uh, deploy uh, spacecrafts that are 300 kilograms and lower uh, that are able to be utilized across Earth observation, further enhance our ecosystem in, um, um, in tertiary education as well as in basic science research and development utilizing space uh, is also a priority and that creates a necessary catalyst and, and development forward. So that's where our focus is for the next five years, targeted as, at a few sectors. In the wider UAE ecosystem, again, we have a, a um, one of our private uh, sector entities, Yasat, that's looking at uh, uh, that's looking at uh, communications uh, spacecrafts, traditional communications spacecrafts, and then also the current transformation that we're seeing in in, in commercial space uh, as it evolves forward. Uh, and then we're working towards developing a comprehensive ecosystem where the UAE can uh, be able to develop full systems and also be able to develop globally uh, portions of some of the subsystems that are key, including some instrumentation. So that's our sort of 10-year overarching outcome. So again, as my final question, um, in the United States, we have given a lot of attention to try to encourage girls to go into STEM education, to get women into STEM careers, yet uh, these areas still remain heavily male in the United States, in Europe, and much of the world. You are arguably the most prominent scientist in the UAE, given your position, given your accomplishments. Um, how do you see uh, your role personally to bring young people, but particularly girls, and sort of young university students and adults, particularly women, into this field to increase, as you say, the diversity that they will bring, uh, what have you done so far, and what do you see your role personally in the future? In the Emirates or outside the Emirates? Because uh, the either. answers are starkly different. Uh, the answer is either or both. In Probably. the Emirates, I have the opposite problem. Mm. I need to get more males into science. <laughs> um, and, and I usually don't like this question, but I'll take it for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Uh, in terms of diversifying in, in, uh, in, in STEM, at least the reason why we don't have this uh, issue in the Emirates is that our organizations are, are relatively new. And what that means is that because of the growth process of when these institutions came to be in the wider uh, lens of the UAE's evolvement, uh, sorry, evolution as a nation, uh, at least it happened over the course of the last two decades and a half where a lot of biasness towards women has been removed from our cultural uh, ecosystem. Uh, and what that then translated into is that the intrinsic biases of old institutions or institutions that have been there for a while that have to undergo cultural transformation that didn't exist in our institutions. Uh, and that's why you have these challenges. Sorry, th that's why you have those. We don't have that issue. Of course, there's nuanced sort of, we do have a science leaky pipeline, but that again is not gender specific. Um, and then diversity becomes very important in terms of capability and outcomes. Um, a third thing that we're doing just to, we're able to enhance equal participation because like I said, we have a lack of interest from boys to enter into STEM more than girls. Um, therefore, we're also taking down the path of having role models and, and just humanizing the, the, those fields so that it's not something that's quite difficult. 
Uh, Can I reverse that question then? Why do you not see boys going into STEM in school and you see girls going into STEM? Are there cultural reasons? Are there family reasons? I actually can't, I don't have an answer to that. Hmm. I've been searching for the answer to that. Um, I'm, I don't have an answer to that um, of why. Um, I, I'm not able to help <laughs> you there. Uh, but that being said, uh, it, it then becomes important. The same tools that you'd use to get girls into STEM, you'd use to get more boys into STEM if the issue was reversed. And mm -hmm. it's about role models. It's about individuals understanding early on where the opportunities are, ensuring that your institutions don't have intrinsic bias. It's just a simple um, mechanism to ensure that you have a diverse um, workforce working in the sciences. And we all know that diversity is actually key to transformative impact in the sciences. Good. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very thank much you. for spending the, your time with us today. Uh, Your Excellency, Sarah Alamuri, Minister of State for Public Education, Advanced Technology, and Chairman of the UAE Space Program. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much for joining thank us Thank you today. so much. Thank you all for coming today.